Hi, my name is Hirko. Um, I've been working for the last 25 or so years in different positions, always doing something related to software development, some system administration, and always uh, some somewhat related to IT security. And open source has always been part of my work. And uh, for the last four and a half years, I've doing, uh, been doing this for the CSERT uh, that's um, for, for large German transportation and logistics company. And part of our job is uh, to defend um, more than uh, 10,000 Linux server systems, most of, uh, most of them in, uh, running in AWS in, um, right now. So, um, Azure, um, Azure systems are probably coming, and um, well, we um, we have been um, doing detection engineering for them uh, for uh, for a couple of years. The team has been doing that before I joined, and um, so uh, what do you want to do if you want to catch attackers on uh, on Linux systems? Just relying on system logs uh, might be easy, but uh, might be the easy things to do. But um, collecting var log messages and such, or, or the author authentication logs, maybe nowadays uh, system D journal, um, that's just just not uh, sufficient. It's easy to collect. Um, you have your um, SIM agent forwarder. Uh, thing you have you have collect uh, you can collect uh, have it collect them uh, and and put it in in the centralized uh, log storage and and analyze stuff there but uh, just um, what you get then is just yeah cron ssh and and, and sudo mumlik uh, about their activities into the logs and um, you don't really uh, get to detect anything interesting we've uh, heard about um uh, the the uh, old techniques for for Linux rootkits uh, the other day, and it's certain that you wouldn't uh, see any traces of those uh, in in those log files. So this is not uh, sufficient, right? We want to do something uh, different, something more interesting. We want to see actual uh, um, attacker behavior and detect it uh, de detect it automatically, such as um, web shells, um, maybe even the um, well, we could detect web shells by uh, seeing, observing that the uh, web application server runs strange commands that it normally wouldn't run, um, or we might even detect uh, the attacker uh, placing the web shell into a web root in the first place. Um, we might want to see uh, de detect a reverse shells such as well, basic uh, bin sh. Uh, which it, with its uh, standard in and standard out and standard error connected to sockets. That might be a tell. We want to see typical reconnaissance activities, post-exploitation, stuff that you wouldn't see in, in the logs I mentioned before. Fileless, ex uh, fileless execution, fileless implants, um, shellcode being in injected into um, uh, processes is um, something um, that might be interested, interesting to detect, and there has been have been publications recently, well, recently in the, in the last few years anyway, um, that um, talked about um, eBPF, BPF um, being used uh, for offensive purposes, even entire rootkits implemented within BPF. So um, we need better telemetry clearly and uh, since everything is a file on linux on, on unix systems it makes sense to watch certain directories especially the configuration directories uh, for uh, for changes um, logging program execution makes sense and maybe um, we should uh, just add some some of those special uh, system calls that deal with um, p trace for the debugging um, uh, a debugging interface that um, gets used for um, uh, for injecting shell codes, and maybe um, also BPF. BPF has its own syscall that uh, has all the functionality put in, into the same syscall, so um, we might want to watch for that too. There's a tool that has been in the Linux kernel for 20 plus years. Um, it's the audit subsystem. It's uh, 
it is easy for uh, easy to configure um, program execution and and file uh, operations. You can um, configure it to to lock um, specific syscalls like those I mentioned before. And um, it also tells us if SA Linux or AppArmor is has been configured um, policy violations of, of, uh, for SA Linux and AppArmor. Um, those get uh, logged to the audit log also. And um, especially for SA Linux, um, the the tooling to diagnose uh, SA Linux failures because it's kind of hard to to um, to operate uh, with uh, third party software and such. Um, those those tools that uh, that people use to diagnose those problems, uh, they rely on the audit log. In fact, it is um, it, it's been there like uh, since the uh, mid two thousands. It's really stable, basic, boring technology. Um, the log file format is is kind of well understood, and uh, the semantics of what is being logged are, are also kind of uh, well understood. And uh, this is kind of, uh, kind of what this looks like. Um, you um, have your you, you decide on a rule set what what you want logged. Um, that gets put into the kernel, and uh, the kernel starts uh, generating events for most mostly syscall related stuff. Um, Audit um, that's a user based component again um, reads those messages from the kernel and puts them into into a log file. There's also a plugin system. Um, that can be used to maybe f uh, forward there are plugins for forwarding um, those order logs via syslog to to a central server. Um, but uh, well, the, uh, the, we'll see about the the plugin system in a minute. Um, there's a problem with this. Um, the the log file format. It's kind of well understood, but and it's key value based, so you should be able to work with this, right? And um, if you just run a basic old school um, Perl based reverse shell. This is kind of what you get. Everything is there, but uh, it's not really readable. Um, now, decoding hex values is not that hard, but uh, it's it's uh, it's hard to do at scale uh, within the theme. So um, this is really not the the format you want. You can you can still see that Perl is being run. Uh, you can still see that there's a minus e uh, parameter, but but the rest, yeah, who knows? After uh, till till after decoding. Another problem is that uh, you have um, one event split across multiple lines, and you have to uh, pull those together. That's also not easy to do within a seam. Might be easy to do with. Um, uh, with, with databases that, pro um, that that support proper joins, but uh, at least Splunk does not, and uh, well, we'll have to find another solution for that. A solution for that. Um, the uh, the um, one-liner reverse shell uh, looks really like this, and if you had the um, the plain text or the, or the decoded text, uh, you could actually see what uh, what's going on pretty well. Uh, there's an IP address, a port, and uh, well, you can see um, later on that the that the shell gets spawned, so the the attacker gets gets a reverse shell, easy as that. Uh, our solution, well, we try to uh, for a while we try to do do things, uh, do some post processing within Splunk, and uh, it was kind of like an 80% solution. Um, it it worked kind of, but um, kind of isn't enough. Um, so uh, we um, developed a um, a plugin, um, like I showed in the uh, diagram before, uh, that uh, takes the the messy output format and uh, pulls all the lines together um, and outputs uh, JSON lines uh, formatted outputs that can be uh, you can it's even grappable and you can work easier with that. Um, there's some uh, enrichment facilities uh, such as um, uh, we have process tracking, so you can uh, get proper uh, parent-child relationships um, that you can query uh, in your sim context, and um, also some process labeling to uh, build up context that wouldn't otherwise be there. This is very very helpful for um, uh, for eliminating uh, eliminating uh, false positives when. You, you have written some some rule that uh, is supposed to detect some 
uh, some some kind of weirdness, and uh, lo and behold, um, you are in an enterprise environment, and uh, people do weird stuff in an enterprise environment, um, in an enterprise environments. Um, so you kind of have to uh, can deal with that uh, by labeling those processes uh, in the first place. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely useful to um, be able to tell that this uh, weird find command that you were looking for, um, that it actually has been run by uh, by Qualys, and uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's supposed to be doing that, and it's it's not ac uh, attack activity. That's uh, that's um, a uh, an example for this. Uh, another thing we do um, uh, in Laurel is um, whenever a new uh, program is executed, we look at its environment and lock some um, selected environment variables so um, that detects or that, or that lets us detect um, all those uh, user space LD preload based rootkits. Easy as that. Um, and there are also some filtering capabilities, uh, so you can cut down your uh, logs for size. Um, maybe more is coming uh, for that in the near future. Uh, the program has been um, released under um, GPL v3, and we have been using it uh, since in, in production since uh, late 2022, and have been enjoying better logs ever since, and it's really been a great help. So this is what... Uh, what our setup looks like. Um, you still have uh, your audit D running, and uh, well, you could even configure that uh, to to not output its own log file format anymore, but just uh, pipe everything to to Laurel and have Laurel it uh, Laurel um, uh, write log files. Those get then picked up by by the Splunk forwarder, and that's it. Um, we have an, uh, uh, quite an elaborate rule set and uh, many detections running in, in the back end. I've been happy with that. And um, so at some time we thought that we might do better um, with, uh, with um, introducing an EDR solution. Um, after all, what we had been doing has been pretty much um, uh, common sense basic stuff from, from my perspective anyway. And um, maybe um, those, those vendors are smarter than we are, and um, well, it, it would uh, also take uh, take away a lot of um, work that we had to uh, have to put into the into our own stuff. That maybe we can do better with our time. Um, this doesn't go well, um, as you could uh, might have guessed from uh, from my title. All those products we looked at, well, we had uh, we, um, they they are made for Windows basically. Uh, we talked to to quite a few vendors um, extensively, um, asked their sales engineers questions, and uh, took some products to the lab. Um, but we did not find any product that uh, uh, that was doing better than uh, than what we had, and we couldn't even replicate what uh, our own work on those systems. Sad to say. So uh, some, some some examples are that uh, well. You, you can even see f uh, from the jargon that uh, when, you, when they uh, tell you uh, that there was a create process event, create process is the, uh, is, is the name of the API call on Windows or one of the API calls uh, to um, spawn new processes on. Um, it might be a superficial um, uh, thing to, to look at, but uh, you, you can kind of see um, what... what um, what kind of thoughts went into into, into porting the product? Um, if we even saw um, some products uh, putting uh, Windows-style SIDs uh, next to um, well-known users like root. That made no sense at all. Um, not all products uh, even had a concept of a numeric user. Uh, that's that has been pretty important in uh, some of our detections or, or, or group IDs. And uh, the most funny thing I found in, in one product was um, that they had um, they, they just assumed that uh, file names are valid Unicode, and if they were not valid Unicode, uh, the product would just drop the events. Um, it has been fixed by uh, the vendor that we had in the lab, uh, whose product we had in the lab, but uh, there might be others 
um, uh, that uh, still have this flaw. And if anybody is interested in, in doing some offensive research against EDR Linux rootkits, uh, I certainly don't. Uh, but but feel free to to see this as an inspiration. So uh, in the end, long story short, we uh, we decided uh, not to um, buy an EDR solution for for those Linux systems. We we have some for Windows, but uh, uh, not not for uh, we we stayed without them um, on Linux. And um, but we still had a need to do something in the R category uh, response um, and uh, building building context around um, alerts. And uh, being able to to really do basic things like get a process list or, um, at the time of an alert or uh, list um, open network connections uh, using something like Netstat, but um, not relying on the tooling on the system because you know rootkits and such um, they they might, it might have been hidden. Yeah, those uh, those basic things. Um, using Yara rules to to hunt for uh, known bad stuff. Um, is an is an interesting use case also, and so uh, we we looked um, after the the failed EDR product uh, project. Uh, we looked at um, alternatives to do just that one tool for one job, right? And um, we looked at uh, OS query and uh, and fleet management around OS query, and also at Velociraptor. And we have heard about Velociraptor before this week, and we ended up using this. Velociraptor is a digital forensic and incident response tool that works at scale. It's kind of it's a spiritual successor to GRR um, that had been developed at Google. That's no coincidence. Mike Cohen, who had worked uh, on GRR at Google, um, uh, at some point left and built up his own company around Velociraptor. Um, one can see that um, some of the lessons of G uh, GRR, stuff that had been good has been continued, stuff that has been bad has been has been improved upon. Uh, Velociraptor is written in Go as a single statically linked binary. It's very useful. It's kind, kind of large, but uh, it, uh, you just deploy your, your client and um, it, it speaks to a, to a centralized uh, server like a well C2 for the good guys, and uh, uh, then you start uh, querying your fleet uh, using so-called artifacts. Artifacts are written in uh, uh, a, a language that's um, SQL inspired. It's called VQL. It's a bit quirky, and you have to get used to debugging this uh, or developing deb debugging this. Uh, but it has been working for us pretty well. Uh, we also ran into um, the, the the problem that um, most users so far seem to be uh, Windows users uh, who are using this at scale. Um, but uh, with an open source project, uh, we can at least um, uh, fill in the gaps our, uh, on our own and um, contribute back. And um, this has been a great experience, really. One of the, the great things you can do as an uh, open source project maintainer is uh, be fast in reacting to uh, merge requests. And uh, Mike has been great at that and has been giving great feedback. And uh, it has been a pleasant experience altogether. So that's uh, that's basically what we have done. Um, this uh, is uh, this doesn't uh, exist in a vacuum. Of course, you have to do some support infrastructure. That um, if you manage to to buy this from a vendor, um, much of that is taken care of. And so we have had to do some uh, work that wouldn't about, uh, wouldn't normally be considered um, core business of a C cert. Uh, we had to build up some uh, support infrastructure, um, such as um, providing diagnostic scripts for, um, to to admins um, that tell them that they might have misconfigured something, uh, and uh, the, all the software we deploy and software and configuration we deploy, we uh, do this in form of um, Debian and RPM packages, and um, run our own. Um, uh, a server that can be configured in apt uh, or yum or dnf or whatever you use we do this for i think two, uh, a dozen different um, distributions and, and versions 
there. And uh, we have a quite quite a diverse infrastructure to, re, uh, to protect, and um, yeah, that's that's been going good. And um, support requests have gone down since we introduced this, and yeah, that's that's basically uh, how we have ended up defending still defending Linux without uh, EDR software. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know if Kantan is here, but the obvious question would be, how does this overlap with the Kunai? Are you competitors, uh, complementary, partially overlapping? Mm. There are um, certainly overlaps. Uh, Kunai is based on uh, BPF, and, um, well, we have been doing this for a few years. BPF has, a, has the problem in enterprise IT that uh, you have to deal with um, distributions uh, that have a um, 10 or 15 year um, support life cycle and they run on old kernels and um, getting uh, BPF based uh, systems to, to run on those old systems uh, is certainly a challenge. Uh, if, if at all possible. So we decided uh, to not go with uh, BPF or not move to BPF uh, just yet. And um, that, that's, that's the, the, the low-level technical answer to the question. Uh, I've been looking at Kona. I am I'm pretty impressed. Um, I'm not sure if we are going to uh, start using that or maybe develop something um, that's closer to um, to to to, um, to, uh, to producing uh, log files like we have them now. Uh, that's, but we are uh, we are definitely looking at something BPF based for the future. The, the time would be right about now, I think, to 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 even start this in in, in enterprise uh, <laughs> and legacy uh, heavy enterprise environment. Thanks, Ilka. Any questions? I'm just curious, what's the performance penalty to enable uh, auditing in, uh, these days? Because it used to be pretty expensive a long time ago. Uh, there, are, there is some, um, uh, th there is of course some, some performance penalty, yes. Um, I can give a, I cannot give you a short definitive answer uh, for that, sorry. Uh, but um, when I started developing Laurel, um, or before, uh, before we did that, um, um, we did some measurements um, f f uh, around products that um, well, we had we had audit D in place, right? Um, so uh, there was some performance overhead or some some CPU usage, extra CPU usage there, and uh, we looked at uh, different solutions that took those audit logs and uh, and, and made something something more beautiful out of them. Or, or different uh, alternatives. We looked at uh, Audit Beat and um, from from Elastic, and uh, we also looked at Sysmon for Linux when that came out. Um, and they uh, they were much worse than uh, what we had, uh, at least in the beginning. I'm uh, I haven't measured for quite some time, but I, I did. What I did was uh, generate some. Um, some artificial workloads, like spawning a thousand, thousand processes a, a second, 10,000 processes a, a second, uh, see um, how the system behaves until it breaks, until it starts losing uh, events and uh, measuring CPU time. That's, that's kind of what I did. And uh, well, we, we are doing pretty well uh, as compared to, to Audible and Sysmon for Linux. And uh, uh, there is a... Uh, a performance graph. Those measurements are on the, on the um, are part of the Laurel repository. If you want to look at that, um, the slides, by the way, um, you should be able to to get to them uh, via the QR code, and uh, all the links in the presentation are clickable. So uh, you should be able to find that there. Anyone else? There he was. Yeah, uh, th thank you for your talk. Um, I want to bounce on your remark about uh, eBPF. So this is true that it's not like on the oldest kernel, 
but there is always this reflection behind this is like, isn't it better like just to support people and tell people like to update the kernel rather than trying to protect something which is flawed by default? Because I mean, eBPF is supported since 5.4 or even better uh, before, uh, I guess, but I mean, it's kind of pretty old already. And, uh, I mean, yeah, what's the point of protecting one machine, which is like kernel two, three, or four? So, yeah, this is always that, that question. And isn't it better, like, just to, to help people, like, updating their kernel? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think there, uh, there are bits in our IT infrastructure that are very conservative and, um, people ha have been running the systems. They, they get some uh, support from the vendor for maybe 15 years. And, um, I, uh, it's not my, um, my job or my position to tell them to, to fucking upgrade. That's, that's not why, uh, what I'm there for. Um, I have to, I have to work with, uh, with what's there. Um, if there are, um, if the, the systems, or when when the systems drop out, drop out of getting support, uh, we can uh, we can tell the, uh, tell people to cut it out and and get rid of those, but um, but not not before that. And um, extended support is well, ex extended long term support is, is is something that we unfortunately have to deal with. Yeah. I, and, I uh, cannot solve that. I, I think. Yeah. yeah In principle, I agree with you. Yeah. And, and any like uh, any EDR you will probably find in the in the landscape will be using eBPF anyway, and Sysmon for Linux as well is using eBPF. So yeah, I, I don't think there is like uh, uh, great solutions uh, except yours uh, if you don't have uh, eBPF enabled. Because it yeah. it allows you basically to have great visibility and hook points in the kernel, but uh, yeah, without this, it's like custom kernel modules, and we see what it can lead to with the global strike bug of this year. So no one wants to do that again, and uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it's not even well, it's it's, it's not even um, guaranteed that if you have something that uh, relies on, entirely on EPPF that you cannot crash your system or make your crist uh, system unusable. I mean, the the, the whole um, code and, and kernel versus user land uh, discussion, from my point of view, is kind of a red herring. It's kind of what a red herring. It's uh, it's 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 missing the point. I think. Okay. It's easy to make uh, IT systems unusable from user land. And, uh, and, and antivirus vendors have uh, demonstrated that uh, again and again. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Nothing to add on my side. All right, thanks. Anyone else? Last chance? Or maybe not?